I'm Aaron. Um, I'm a freelance journalist. I specialize in interactive and map-based storytelling. Um, most of my work revolves around what I would call small data, so data sets that aren't already harvested or existing in large repositories or already collected by government agencies, but data sets that haven't yet been recorded for like the wider world, so you have to go out and record those data sets yourself, um, kind of what the last speakers were talking about. Um, yeah, and I do work for places like the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Pudding, um, places that publish interactive map-based uh, stories. Uh, and my name is Denise Liu, and I work on the graphics team at the New York Times, where I use DataViz and maps to tell stories. So, sorry. Today we're going to talk about the story that we published earlier this year. Um, it's about how we reported the story about um, Chinese street signs in Manhattan, and we found that they were slowly uh, disappearing. Sorry, having some technical difficulties on the phone. <laughs> yeah, we're doing like speaker notes on the phone and presentation over here, so you just have to bear with us. Um, okay, so a, a quick introduction to the topic. Um, there is a long tradition of um, Chinese residents in American cities giving Chinese names to streets that only have English names officially. So, you know, ever since um, Chinese immigration began to the United States, this has been happening. This is an article um, many decades after the first Chinese immigrants came to the United States, but it's from 1943, um, an author named William Hoy, where he's talking about Waverly uh, um, in San Francisco, for those of you who are familiar with Waverly Place. He mentions two names, neither of which are Waverly. One of them is based on a large temple that was on the street, and the other one was 15 Cent Street, which was the cost of a haircut at the Chinese barbers that used to line these streets, right? So referring to streets in ways um, based on like their experience of the streets. And so um, these Chinese names for streets were rarely, if ever, official. So they were just like used person to person, like I'm going to 15 Cent Street or I'm going to Dead Person Street, you know, to like communicate within the community. Um, and they also, they varied map to map and person to person. So one wave of Chinese immigrants might refer to it as one thing and another wave of Chinese immigrants might refer to it as another thing. Um, and so one street could have many names. And then we go to the next slide. Right, so our story, New York City is one of the most linguistically diverse cities in the United States. It has large populations of people speaking many different languages, but Chinatown is the only neighborhood in New York City that has official uh, street signs in another language, in a, in a language that isn't English. And so why that happened, how it happened, who was responsible, answering these questions became an obsession because that history hadn't really been documented, uh, at least in like the popular press. So um, in 2016, I was researching this topic for This American Life Story, and in that process, um, in an old dusty filing cabinet in a local library in like the manager's office in New York City, I found this article um, from 1985, and it was talking about the 40 streets that were given uh, official Chinese bilingual street signs. But I live in Chinatown, I've lived there for many years, I work in Chinatown, I know these street signs, and I knew for a fact there's no way that there was 40 streets that had these signs. It was probably more like 20. And so um, the rest of them are English language only. So there was like this historical record that didn't match my sort of like present day understanding of the landscape. So I did what journalists, well, we did what journalists often do. We, uh, we started to write to all of these different uh, city organizations to be like, hey, you put up the signs, tell us about where you installed them and when you took them down, right? Like, can we just have a record of this basic civic infrastructure that was installed and removed? Um, that it was what we thought were pretty simple questions. Um, we got no help. Um, we basically tried like multiple strategies. Every organization that has a tangential relationship to um, street signs or language in New York City, and we were basically laughed out of city agencies in in one sense, literally laughed out of the city agency. Um, so that was all before um, we, well, Aaron brought the story to the New York Times. And so when um, I started looking into it, I was like, well, surely 
why don't you just ask the city? They must have some sort of database. So we, you know, I <laughs> didn't believe that we couldn't get anything. <laughs> so we sent out more emails to um, this uh, DOT press person. And yeah, there's, as you can see, a lot of back and forths between these two threads. And there, um, you know, but we were met with one dead end <laughs> to another. And basically we were told that there were like a, there was like a lack of institutional knowledge. We were told records were destroyed. We were told that people who were dealing with this back in, you know, the 1900s were like dead and they didn't like carry on that, uh, that knowledge. So we had to gather our own data. And so I mapped out a walking path. This is just like a Google My Maps. I mapped out a mapping path um, which was in total 12 miles. And basically I just covered uh, every intersection that there could have possibly have been a Chinese uh, language street sign. And it was, you know, a lot. So we split it across two days. So before the walk, I actually made this skeletal map that I drew by hand and it's kind of, um, messy, but it's just for my self-reference. Um, so basically, I, I did it because um, I wanted to just have something on paper to like reference when I was walking around. I just didn't want to have to like input something, uh, you know, in my phone or whatever. It was just taking too long. Um, and also, I had to do this because the streets down there are actually super gnarly. Like they kind of are really jammed in with each other. And so with this, I could just kind of like fudge the geography a bit so I can actually see the intersections myself and have a clear reference of what corner I was talking about when I referenced it later on. Uh, and then as with most projects, I input it into a spreadsheet and I also took a, a photo of every uh, street sign that I saw. So, you know, after we did that walk, um, according to this DOT list that we actually did get, um, there were allegedly more signs printed in 1985 than we had found on the streets in 2021. So then I looked into Google Street View. Um, I looked at all the corners uh, digitally on there and that goes back to like 2009. So I found four examples where bilingual signs were either removed or replaced with um, English only uh, street signs. Um, so that only took us so far because only so many years were listed in Google Street Maps. So uh, we started visiting every single local library, every Chinese bookstore, the archives of Chinese newspapers where available, like anything we could possibly get our hands on that would have reference to where these things used to exist and who put them there and why. Um, but there's really almost no mention in written literature um, aside from a few um, like very short articles in Chinese newspapers that we could find. Um, so we also started contacting like as many old timers as we could find. So people who were working in the Chinatown community or working in the government in like the DOT, but most people had sadly passed away and those who were left were, were very old or were like, I don't remember, this was a very small point in time in my career and this is not something that I like paid attention to 40 years ago. So photos were our savior. So this project is very much like a photographic research project. So you can see here, this is a photograph from a book um, from a, a uh, like a collection of photography. And when we zoomed in, we could see that in the photo that they were capturing for a completely different reason, there was a street sign that we could put to a date and we're like, oh, those two don't exist anymore. So we, um, I went on Amazon, I bought this little magnetic loop. And so this is, uh, or magnetic, magnifying loop. And so this is Denise at the Museum of Chinese in America, which has an extensive archive of photographs of Chinatown streets. And, you know, we had to sweet talk our way into the archive for hours and hours and hours because it had recently been damaged by a fire, but we like, you know, begged and got our way into the archive. And um, we reached out to local activists, um, local photographers, people who have just been in Chinatown for a long time and owned cameras and were willing to show stuff to us. Um, and we painstakingly went through thousands and thousands of photographs with this um, magnifying glass to look for um, street signs in the background and map them to dates. 
Um, I also um, watched a lot of movies that were filmed in Chinatown in the 1980s. Um, so this is Year of the Dragon, a terrible movie from 1985. And so I would watch these movies on one screen and pause them and then like zoom in, like enhance, enhance to like get to the, the street sign and be like, okay. Um, it wasn't always glamorous work. Um, you know, I had to watch films that were not academic by any measure, but they were filmed in Chinatown in the 1980s. Um, we, oh, that's the end of my. <laughs> okay, so um, I also just want to add that we had a huge time, a, a huge team behind this. We had a digital designer who helped do the digital layout and sort of build the page. Um, we had an editor. We also had a photo editor who hired some really amazing photographers to, like these photos of the street signs, um, the photographer just uh, took a bunch of them and <laughs> I think he took them by just doing a super zoomed in, uh, a super like zoom lens from like far away to get this straight on shot. Um, so when it came to start mapping, um, I had used this uh, map uh, from 1920s by this person named J.P. Wong as inspiration and I really liked how it was kind of a, it was truly a bilingual map. Like he had Chinese and English on there and neither of them like, you know, was distracting from the other and I thought it was a really nice representation of both. And um, I used this book, it's a Japanese book of color combinations, just as uh, inspo and like this um, palette we used uh, on the digital sort of layout as well. And it was sort of similar to that, um, the map I showed earlier. So in the end, I went with a pretty simple map design after many iterations, um, because at the end, all we wanted to do is emphasize the name of the streets in both languages and um, where the signs are in current day. So um, it serves also as a map to like show basically like the, it, it, you know, nowhere else was there online an existing sort of database of both of the names in both languages. And I actually think, <laughs> it's fine. It, I actually think it's the first time that um, there is a, a map in the times of both Chinese and English. I mean, don't quote me on that, but I couldn't find any other one. <laughs> Um, and I really especially like this compass that I had, which has north in Chinese, and it was inspired by J.P. Wong's map, which um, you can see on the right. He had it in all four languages, but, you know, we had to cater to a bilingual audience. Um, something else I really appreciated, which I don't usually get to do with my, like, English-only maps, is that the Chinese language can obviously flow from uh, uh, horizontally and vertically, and usually with English I would have to rotate the text, but... Um, you know, with this, it was it was something that I could just do without having to rotate. So that was a cool thing that I could do. Um, so we showed our main finding in a map that changes as you scroll. And so here is the extent of the Chinese street signs um, when they first were in the 60s, which is like a fairly small kind of area. And, you know, as the community grew, there was a proposal to sort of increase the footprint of the signs in the 80s. And um, here is what it would, here is what it, it does look like in modern day, the extent. And we also translated the piece into Chinese because we, you know, we knew it was really important for uh, audiences who couldn't read English to actually um, understand the story. And uh, the good thing is that the maps were already bilingual. So that was nice. And yeah, we also had a print product for this, which is really cool. This is a wraparound, which is like the front and the back cover of the metro section um, that ran in the New York region. And this photo was um, taken by this amazing photographer, Aram Xu, and it was just like a really cool photo that where it had the spine on the street sign uh, post, which was really nice. And here's part of what it looked like in print. And we had a lot of these really great archival photos that our photo editor pulled, which was really cool. Sweet. Um, so, geez, every time. Uh, a lot of people took notice, which was cool for us. It's interesting seeing the other presenters here who work in like the worlds of academia and like the amazing work that you can do with mapping, like completely changing the perspective based on like a projection that is custom. Our steps in journalism, I think, are smaller. You know, like I think people were really excited to see Chinese on a map in the New York Times, which like seems small, but is like 
This is the Chinese language on Chinatown in New York City. They were also really excited. We included a lot of um, clips of people speaking in multiple dialects that are present through like the various waves of immigration to China, excuse me, to Chinatown. So like, you know, first people were speaking Cantonese and Toysanese, then later generations were speaking Fujianese, Mandarin, and those typically in the American press, the Chinese language is represented as Chinese, right? So the small, what is actually a small gesture, I think, resonated larger of being able to hear the Fujianese dialect in the paper of record. Like, I think this is a panel about, you know, social justice and mapping. Those are kind of the steps that I think we're trying to push towards, not from a social justice perspective, but from a representation perspective, um, which in journalism, I think, is getting towards as close as you can get to a social justice agenda in a paper like the New York Times. Um, this closed. Um, we had some attention from, like, our our local representatives, well, not local, this is a New York State um, Assembly member. And then, uh, oh yeah. Th we also got a bunch of coverage in the Chinese press, which was really fun for us because a lot of the residents of Chinatown that are not English speaking don't read the New York Times, obviously, even though we translated it into Chinese. Um, so this was really cool for us. They did take all of our reporting and not use our names, which was not as... <laughs> <laughs> They're like, check out this cool thing we found. We're like, oh yeah. But it was really amazing because like people that we knew in Chinatown that we had interviewed who don't read the New York Times saw this and, and that was amazing, uh, personally. Um, perhaps like the biggest thing, at least as far as like change goes, is the local council um, member, uh, Christopher Marte, introduced a bill that would replace the signs that had disappeared and also create a process for other communities in New York City who had substantial non-English speaking populations to petition the city to do this in their neighborhood. So, you know, um, whether it's, um, you know, Yiddish or Spanish or uh, Polish, Korean, like there's now hopefully going to be a process for other neighborhoods to do this, which I, I think is pretty cool. Um, is that the end? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we'll take questions. We have time for uh, questions. All right. This is just incredible work, and I have so many questions, but I'll, I'll keep it to one. Um, there's been some somewhat tense discussion and controversy over whether or not uh, languages like Fujianese, Hakka, Cantonese are dialects of Chinese or independent languages in their own right, and especially given current political situations with Hong Kong and tensions between Cantonese and Mandarin-speaking communities. Was there any discussion in the New York Times about whether or not the term dialect was the best term to use to describe the differences between these different communities? Thank you. Um, well, I think like, <laughs> I think uh, I, I will say there was not like a strict um, sort of discussion about whether the word dialect uh, was gonna be used, but I mean, I think the New York Times in general is not, you know, usually we just publish things uh, in, well, we don't even represent these other sort of dialects. We usually just translate things into um, Chinese and, but then like if audio is ever present, it's usually Mandarin or Cantonese. And so I think even having this sort of like a little snippet of an audio in the piece um, was sort of speaking to like, who the people actually in Chinatown are. And I would say that like, our focus was really more about Chinatown and Manhattan than re reflecting what is happening on a global scale. Actually, I think there might have been. Remember, we had this linguist, Patrick Chu, who studies dialects specifically, like in, in depth from a linguistic historical perspective. And we had like hours of conversations with him about like, is should we refer to this as this or this or that? And I think what you're picking up on is how do you summarize the complexity of like, you know, thousands of years of language diversity into a single sentence in the New York Times. And so I think we, we ended on dialect because it like, it worked for what we were trying to say, not because it was the most specific way that you can refer to this like very complex dialectical issue. Um, sometimes that happens in journalism. You're like, what's the most specific we can get without lying if we don't have like a dissertation to introduce to like, say like, here's the difference between Fujianese and Hakka and you know, like, Toichu and, and you know, all, all this, yeah. Great question. Yeah. 
And I guess one more thing I would add is like, this story was, you know, so much of it is like, you have to bring this sort of complexities of the Chinese language to a mostly English speaking audience and having, like Aaron said, to condense that into something simple that, you know, someone who knows nothing about Chinese will understand was kind of like one of our challenges for this piece, um, which wasn't, you know, language wasn't even the main focus, right? It was just like the step into the actual, <laughs> yeah, story. We had all these other drafts of like an introduction to the Chinese language that would have been like five more pages of like cool infographics, but would you believe they cut that? Like. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much for sharing this and also the amount of work you put into it. I'm curious, even if it wasn't published in the story um, for editorial reasons, um, did anybody come to any sort of conclusion or thoughts about what this implies about the sort of political landscape of New York over the last couple of decades? Was there any sort of talk about what this explicit or subconscious erasure um, means? Does that make sense as a question? I'm sure we yeah. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Well, I would just say that we should add that I, through, you know, talking to the DOT in the city, I don't think it was like a malicious, I mean, we, we are for sure, it's not a malicious act. It's just like, a lack of them upkeeping this. I mean, the original program was like only brought to the city because a small group in Chinatown fought for it. And so there wasn't like a standard way of like making these bilingual signs to begin with. And that to the city was just like a one-off thing. So there never was like, they never kept um, whatever, a process for doing this. So it wasn't malicious and, and, and we try to like say that throughout the piece. It was just a lack of like, structure from the city. Yeah. I, I will say that I think like, at least personally, a lot of what drew me to the story is that of like, this story about disappearing and reappearing street signs is actually a story about the waxing and waning of political capital in Chinatown. It's a story of like different infighting groups within Chinatown that have a lot to do with class and origin. It's a story of, you know, of urbanization and suburbanization and like, you know, the creation of ethnic enclaves that then become redundant once, you know, globalization brings products to many different communities within New York City or the suburbs. However, I think, in my personal opinion, what makes good journalism like this is stripping that away from the story and presenting what is true and what happened and then letting people draw their own conclusions with the, the facts that you give them. And so, the response to the story, while the story wasn't explicitly about the geopolitical history of Chinese immigration necessarily, the response was about that because of the context we were able to give, the historical records we were able to dredge up, and the kind of like framing. And I think what so many of the presenters did, um, you know, I'm thinking of like the, the map of redlining, it's like by putting two things next to each other, you don't necessarily have to say, here's what's going on, but the map shows you here's what's going on. And so I think that story hopefully comes through. Thank you again. I should have mentioned this at the uh, beginning of the session, but our final presenter had to cancel at the last moment. Thanks, so, uh, just, you can give a nice round of applause for all of our presenters.